Before the morning worship message, I'd like to say something to our viewers that are watching us on YouTube. Every Sunday we have communion as a central part of our worship service, and today I had a special experience receiving communion, and I want to share it with you. This old man was telling a bunch of people how when he was a young boy in France, he was an atheist, and he was with two or three other friends that were atheists. And they met a bet with each other uh, that to go stand in the cathedral in France and look at Jesus hanging on the cross and say out loud, all you, this you did for me, and I don't give a damn. And so this one young man who was an atheist, he walked into the cathedral in France. And he looked up at the crucifix and he said, all this you did for me and I don't... And he said, I've been a follower of God ever since that moment. Because I realized, even as an atheist, what Jesus did for me. And so those of you listening on, on YouTube, I hope, if, if you're not going to church anywhere and you would like to have the central part of your life, be remembering Jesus and his broken body and his shed blood, come and join us at Horton First Christian Church. I'd like all you present now to look at our scripture passage. And isn't it isn't it terrifying? It's just tiny little print, and it goes on forever. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> I'm just going to speak into the main teaching points of this scripture today. I was sharing this scripture with a friend of mine who doesn't go to any church. He has a deep faith in God, but he has a different faith, and he had never heard the story of. Paul and Silas uh, having the demon cast out of this fortune teller. And he had never heard the story about Paul and Silas singing in jail. After they'd been beaten up, they were singing praises to God. In our adult Sunday school class today, we were talking part of the time, just a very brief period of the time, about uh, demonic things that go on in the world. Uh, most of our Sunday school class is much more positive than that. But Paul and Silas were visiting this city, and for a number of days, this young lady who had the gift of prophecy was following them and yelling out, these men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. And she did this for a number of days, and Paul, it finally got, the Bible says, fed up with this. She was interrupting his ability to talk. And he realized that this was a demonic thing in that girl. She, she could tell the future, but it wasn't of God. It was a demonic thing. And so he said, he commanded the spirit that was in her, get out. In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And the demonic spirit was gone. And she was a slave girl, and she was owned. She had a couple of owners that made a lot of money. You know, fortune tellers make a lot of money. There are not too many around anymore. Well, when I was a kid, there were quite a few around. But there's still people that, that have spiritual gifts that can foresee the future. And I'm not saying that every fortune teller is demon-possessed, but in this case... This young girl was, and Paul realized, wait a minute, this is not a God. And it was, you know, it was interrupting his ability to share Jesus. I've had a situation in my own life recently. Somebody was interrupting people's ability to find God. And it just dawned on me this week, wait a minute, that's a demonic thing that's going on. And so since I realized that this week, I've been praying really the same thing that, that 
Jesus, or that Paul prayed here, is God, bind this demonic spirit because it's keeping people from finding wholeness. It's keeping people from finding God. And, and I confronted that person. And uh, so that's what Paul did. Well, what happened was, when you're making a lot of money and somebody ruins your business, you get pretty upset. And these two men beat up Paul, beat him up rather badly. And uh, I won't read all this scripture, but they, they took him to the Roman authorities and said, these men are dis disturbing the peace. They're dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. <laughs> they lied. <laughs> they wrecked our way of making a living, and we want them punished. So they used uh, the racist card. They, they called them Jews. And that's, that was racism in those days in that culture. And so... The officials, the judges, the Roman judges, ordered them to be uh, publicly beaten. So, now remember, Paul and Silas had already been beaten up by the two guys that lost their fortune teller. Then they were publicly beaten by the Roman authorities and thrown into jail. I've only been beaten up once or twice. <laughs> But it's not a good thing. <laughs> a, a friend of mine, a uh, uh, really close friend, and I said, how come, how come you quit drinking? And he said, well, you know, I'm about five foot eight, and I weigh about 100 pounds, and when I drank, I would fight anybody in the bar. <laughs> and he said, I woke up one night after being knocked out in the dark, laying on the ground behind a bar, <laughs> And I decided I needed to quit drinking. And uh, uh, these guys were all beat up. Paul and Silas were all beat up. And they were singing praises to God in jail. And they weren't psychotic. <laughs> what it was was they were delighted that they could suffer for sharing the good news about Jesus. They could suffer for casting that demon out of that young girl. And they were delighted that they were having persecution just like Jesus did. And just like Stephen did, who was murdered. And, you know, it's, it's really people that aren't followers of God that have a hard time believing that. And uh, so, as they were praising God, a tremendous earthquake shook the jail. Now, this part of the world, there's a lot of earthquakes there. There was just, a few months ago, there was another major earthquake that it shook that area. It shook that jail so badly, they were chained, and all the chains fell out of the walls. The prisoners could have walked away. And so the keeper of the prison, he got out of sword. He was going to commit suicide because he was sure that all the prisoners had run away. And Paul and Silas stopped him and said, no, 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 nobody's run away. And he had heard them singing praises to God. And... Uh, Paul said, don't do it. We're still all here. Nobody's run away. And this is in the middle of the night. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. He saw all the prisoners were still there. He'd heard them singing praises to God. And he said something that's really significant, which is the title of this message. He said, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved to really live? I just had an agnostic call me this morning just before church service, and I'm going to have to call him back later. 
That's the point he reached in his life. What do I have to do to really live? And he's getting really excited about it, and he had to call me. He forgot that I was a pastor. <laughs> and he said, this stuff is really working, Ron. I'm, I'm really becoming a whole person. My, my family's having a hard time dealing with me because <laughs> I've changed so much. I don't have the bond I have, used to have with my family. I said, well, that's totally normal for people that have had a tremendous life change. You're a different person. And so what happens when we become a Christian is that's when we really start to live. When, when we come to God, and everybody comes to God in a slightly different way, we really start to live. And so they said to this jailer, Put your entire trust in the Master Jesus. Now this is something that you and I in the English language don't have too much. We talk about Jesus, we talk about Jesus the Messiah, we talk about Jesus Christ, but we don't say Master Jesus. But that's what communion is all about. God, I know you're the Master. I remember Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. One time when I was in graduate school, I was arguing with God. I was down in Oklahoma. I was on like 160 acres of just flat Oklahoma land. I walked out into the middle of it, and I said, God, I know you're sending me somewhere, and I want to know where it is. And it wasn't a physical voice, but it was real. And the word patience was said to me. Now, that's long before I was in the military. I was just in graduate school. But it was like a four-star general speaking to the lowest private in the entire United States Army. And I realized it was the Lord speaking to me. And basically, I said, I know a direct command when I hear it, and I'll be patient. And then how God has led me ever since then has just been entirely dramatic. But... Put your entire trust in the master, Jesus. When, when we talk about Jesus here, we're talking, according to the Gospel of John and the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, we're talking about the creator of the universe. This is not just some little God on a shelf somewhere. This is the creator of the universe who's reaching down into time and space and touching your life and my life. This is the master, or sometimes in the army we'd say the master blaster. <laughs> this is the creator. This is not some subordinate god in a Hindu pantheon. This is the creator. Well, then they began to explain to the jailer that Jesus was the Messiah, that he changed the whole world. And the entire family of the jailer got in on this and they never did go to bed that night. They were up all night long. The jailer, right at that point, made them part of his family. And his, everyone in his household became believers in Jesus. He dressed their wounds. Now, they were laying in jail with undressed wounds, praising God joyfully praising God, when the earthquake hit, their wounds finally got dressed. The jailer made them feel right at home. He couldn't wait until morning. He says, I want to be baptized. And the jailer and all his family were baptized. And then they had a celebration. In the morning, nobody had slept, and he had all this good food for Paul and Silas, probably the other prisoners too. He became a Christian in a pagan society. He realized that earthquake was not by chance. He realized they were praising the creator, the master Jesus. And his whole life became totally changed. And I will guarantee you that that family became the center of a new church 
in that area. And the last sentence in this scripture is, he and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. A couple of Sundays ago, I was in Lewisburg, Kansas. The first church I served 54 years ago, and they had their 150th celebration. Everybody in that church was in on the celebration. I have never seen, and it's a church about the size of us, I have never seen more joy and more thankfulness to God in a, in a congregation like that. Big churches can't pull off something like that. But these folks have known each other in Miami County all their lives. And they're alive with God's love. And it was a tremendous meal. The tremendous meal was a great celebration after the, after the worship service. And really, this is what I hope starts happening in your life and is happening right now. Like the young man who called me on the phone just before church. That it's fun to have God in your life and the Holy Spirit in your life. You've never had peace like this before. You've never had joy like this before. Every day is a celebration. Even bad days are a celebration. And you go from joy to joy and peace to peace and love to love. Amen.